Hi, I'm Mark Rutten. Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. And we are back building the Bushi Dory. Now in the last episode, we started fixing a big mistake that I made with the transom. We had a bunch of fasteners and uh, fastener holes kind of blow out on the inside of the transom. And that was because the transom was too thin. So we've got to fix it. And our fix has been to create an overlay. So we made a book matched set of panels that are going to cover up the inside face of the transom. They're gonna add an extra half inch of thickness to it so that when we put the fasteners back in, there's plenty of meat there to hold them. In addition to those overlay panels that we're applying to hide the face of that transom, we're gonna add a doubler onto the top. And that's gonna add cross grain strength to the transom. And it's also gonna hide the fact that we did this repair at all because it's gonna conceal the fact that the lower portion of the transom is now thicker than the upper portion that protrudes above the shear line. So let's go get right down to it. Okay, now the next I want to think about my doubler here. So over my overlay, I'm just going to pick up the center line on top of my knee using my dividers to describe a nice arc. I want this to have some nice shape to it. I'm just using the bottom of this planking as my location for the bottom of the arc and I will uh, take the next one up higher. In fact, I think, I think what I'm gonna do, let's raise this just a hair, because I want to make sure that my doubler goes all the way back and picks up the back of that, the full face of that planking. So this is gonna be, I'm gonna just cut that off square, I think, and my doubler will nest up against it. It'll rise up and pick up the shear line as well. these out and we'll trim them down. Okay what I decided to do is I'm just going to go with straight bedding compound where the solid wood planking lies here. So I'm just going to carefully squeeze a little bit of this in here. I don't want it to be too heavy but I do want it to fill the joint. So, so we want it fairly thick down right by the lap of the next plank so that it fills that little gap that is naturally there. So that's gonna create sort of a barrier for the epoxy. Even if epoxy squeezes out past the, um, the this little filler piece I've created, it's gonna hit that bedding compound and it won't bond to it. This is oil-based bedding compound. It doesn't really harden exactly. It can dry up but it's not like um, polyurethane or any of these adhesive bedding compounds. This is basically just made out of linseed oil and sawdust, presumably. I do want this uh, doubler to bond to the transom, so I'm trying to not contaminate the surface of the transom with any of the bedding compound. There's just tiny, tiny spots of it here and there. So wherever epoxy squeezes out around the knee, we'll worry about cleaning that up after it's cured. Same thing along the uh, garbard planks and same thing along the top. All of that is easy to clean up. Okay, so I'm just buttering this up now and I'm using uh, thickened epoxy, thickened to about a jam consistency. And I'm just using this notched spreader to move it around. Just making sure you hit all your faying surfaces, as we say. Now I'm leaving this top edge undone because that's going against the lap strake of the solid wood planking. And I'm trying to isolate the modern construction from the traditional construction as much as possible. And that's really just for ease of repairability in the long run. Now unfortunately I didn't get any footage of the clamping process. The camera's card filled up and once you're gluing things up you really can't stop to mess around with cameras. Suffice to say, it took some juggling and swearing, and we'll just move on to the next day when it's all cured and ready to take apart. Okay, so our piece is glued up. Let's take our clamps off and have a look at it. So you see I had to use this uh, cantilevered clamp here, I suppose you might call it, to uh, get some pressure down in the front. I made this little this little guy here. This is actually a hold down for that I use on my table saw, but it worked really nicely to just apply pressure down lower away from the glue line. It feels like, ah, oh, damn it, I might have a little bit of misalignment down here, so 
I might have a bit of shaping to do to bring this into alignment, which is a little annoying. I could get away with not doing anything too, I'm sure it wouldn't be a problem. But we'll, we'll try and fix that up. If you're new to woodworking and you're trying to take it up to the next level, uh, I really recommend you go out and get yourself a card scraper. This is the most economical and versatile tool that you can possibly get. Card scrapers are about almost as easy to sharpen as a pencil. Just clamp them in a vise. You take a file, and I've got a little tool that holds this at a right angle, but that's not even that necessary. You just want to square up that edge. And then you take a burnisher, anything that's good and hard. This happens to be carbide. This could even be a screwdriver. Leonard Lee of Lee Valley showed me how to do this. Just use your burnisher with just a couple fingers. This is all the pressure you need. And just slowly roll a little angle onto there. Start square, roll it down about three degrees, something like that. That's perfect. You don't need a big hook. A small hook is stronger and sharper in the long run than a big hook. Okay, well there we go. There's our repair and I think that looks pretty darn good. It might, I might even go so far as to say that it has improved the appearance of this uh, area of the boat. Now there is a glue line that's a little heavier than I would like. What can you do? We are human. We are fallible. It's not too bad. I can live with that. Next I think I'm going to start working on this cross grain doubler that goes in up here. This is really a structural component that adds strength across the grain of the transom and it provides a little bit more material where the sculling notch is going to go. Now the trick here is that I've got this little doubler in here that we have to accommodate. What we're going to do is we're going to spile for this part. Now spiling is where we create a pattern but we're taking into account bevels and thicknesses. So what I've got here is just a piece of scrap and what I've done I've just notched out the bottom. Well you notice this is like a completely random shape and I don't really care about that. What's important to me is how it registers. It's got to lie flat on the surface we're trying to spile apart to fit. And in this case, because I've got this crown surface here, I'm just registering off two points on it. Now this happens to be a section of a circle, so that helps me. I want to set this guy on here and then take my spiling block. So this is a spiling block. It's usually about two or three inches square and we've got a bevel cut on one face of it. So the important thing here is that the thickness of this plus the thickness of whatever piece of material you're spiling onto matches the thickness of the part that you're trying to make. Very, very important and that's the key to making all of this work. So in the case of this little guy, I've had to add just a little shim of wood onto the bottom of it in order to adjust the thickness of the whole thing. So what I want to do is I want to just carefully lay this in here and all I need to do is slide it up to the surfaces I'm trying to spile to. And so just the, the leading edge of this little bevel hits those surfaces. And then with my pencil, sharpened as we do as boat builders, with one side flattened off, I describe along the back side, move my block, do it again. Just trying to find, pick out a couple points to define this shape. And I've put a center line on here as well. And the key is to make sure that you've got this nice, a nice neutral attitude. You don't want this rising up on your planking or sitting up on any little bits of sawdust that might be trapped under there. So that you have to be careful about that. So that's all I need from this right now. I could pick off heights over here, but I'm just going to make this overly tall for the time being and worry about cutting it down a bit later. So this is the material I'm going to be making my finished part out of. And what I've done is I have drawn a center line on where I want it to go and this has already been pre-cut to the radius of the finished part that it has to jive up to and I'm just getting my pattern to touch that curve in a couple of spots there and I've aligned it with a center line here and now here's the trick we take that spiling block and now we just flip it over so the bevel now goes on the inside and touches our pattern right on the line then we take our pencil 
flattened on one side and we very carefully project a line down onto our stock here. You have to be very careful you don't move your template while you're doing this or you're spiling. We do that again. So do that on both sides and then basically all I need to do is connect those dots. Now the next thing, job is to go over to the boat and take some bevels off of the actual the existing boat so that I know what angle I need to cut this line to. The angle we need is right here. We want to go square to this joint right there. Do it on the other side as well and just double check it. See, so make sure they're even. Perfect. Okay. So now we're going to go to the bandsaw and we're going to cut this out. point where I want to drill my sculling notch and the angle I think is important. My doubler block isn't fastened in here yet, it's still loose and I have some shaping I want to do on the top but I feel like the first thing I need to do is get this hole established. So I'm going to use a hole saw for doing that but in order to drill with the hole saw I've got quite a bit of depth to deal with. I can't do that all in one shot so I need to start with a pilot hole. Now I've sketched out on my transom where I think the general shape is going to go and I've established where I think the center of the sculling hole is going to go. I'm going to use my shot built spade bit to do my initial pilot hole just because I know it drills so nice and clean. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick an angle that's in between square to the transom face and the rake of the shear. So somewhere around halfway. I'm going to follow it up with a quarter inch auger bit with a lead screw. That's going to give me a pilot hole that the hole saw is going to follow. So if my shear is about there that square right about here. If I, I like to think about what angle would, a, would an oar be passing through here. I'm carefully lining up with the center line on the transom. So before I go any farther, I just want to have a double check and make sure I'm heading where I want it to. I'm looking at my hole that I drew in the back there. I think I'm going to bring this up just a hair. Just a little tiny bit. There we go. Now hopefully I've landed dead center on the other side. If I haven't, I may have to adjust that a little bit. I'm using an auger bit with a lead screw on here to uh, finish off drilling this pilot hole. I've got a three inch hole saw here and I've added a longer pilot bit onto it. And that's just so it guides its way through the hole a little more nicely. Now I want to try and attack these holes from both sides. So I'm going to go in through the doubler here and just try and get started into the transom proper and then I'll flip it around to the other side. Now when using large hole saws, the best thing to do is just put it on low and go slow.
the glue and the transom doubler here. I've applied bedding compound to the planking because I don't want to bond the doubler to the planking. I only want to bond it to the transom. And so that's going to act like a resist. I just want to have a little bit of wiggle here to get it to seat nicely. There we go. Looks good. I'm going to get a couple clamps on here, squeeze down on it, and that'll do it. And we'll just leave it until it cures. Just some gentle pressure to get a little bit of glue squeezing out. There we go, that's nice. Now to clean up, these painter's knives can come in handy. They're a little on the thin side, I think, a lot of the time. So if you can get a stiffer one, that's probably better. Well, if they're too thin, they like to dig into the grain of the wood. And usually we have a rag and alcohol for cleaning up any squeeze out that we don't want to leave behind. Generally the alcohol works okay on the bedding compound too. Not quite as well as other solvents, but it'll do the job. Just take away the excess bedding compound as well. Be careful if you have any that's sort of combined with the epoxy, that's certainly something you're just gonna throw away. You're not gonna try and reuse it elsewhere. Okay, and that's about all we can do. We'll just leave that till tomorrow, take the clamps off, and we can do the rest of our cleanup once that's done. All right, we're done. Now, there's a little more work to do. We still have to shape the top of the transom, but I like to leave that towards the end of the job. Sometimes having that transom projecting up above the shear line gives us some place to, sh to attach some braces so that when we're working on other parts of the boat, we can stabilize it and keep it from jumping around. You can see when I was drilling that sculling notch in there, how the boat was jumping all over the place. So some braces attached to that transom would have actually stabilized the boat a little bit more and made that job a bit easier. If you're one of my Patreon supporters and watching this on Patreon, stick around because there's some bonus material in just a moment. If you're not one of my Patreon supporters, please consider joining us over there. Your support makes these videos possible and pledges start for as low as a dollar per month. Now for the rest of you, you can still subscribe and like and share and all that good stuff and I will see you later. We had a little mistake on one of the frames, it's a similar situation. And it happened here on this one. If you look closely, we've got a nail poking through the face. So I'm going to fix that. I'll drive it back out. I'm not going to try and drive it too deep. I just want to get the head to protrude past the face of the planking. This is a proper nail punch, so that means that the very tip of it is hollow. And so it's going to grab the tip of that nail there. Okay, next I use a pry bar. And that's to protect my planking and I use my nippers and I grab them very close. And very carefully choking up on this nail as much as possible. I come in there and just gently weasel it out a tiny bit at a time. Don't rush this. There we 
we go. Now what I'm going to have to do in order to repair this is I'm going to fill that hole first. We're going to have to scooch it over just a little bit and I'm going to do what I can to try and swell that planking back up before I put a new nail in there. Okay, now I'll take my cloth and a hot iron. I'm just going to try and steam that out. I'll switch to another part of the cloth that's damp. It's already raised it quite a bit. It won't get it 100%, but it'll get it awfully close. You can say fibers that have just been compressed, it can bring them right back. But any ones where the fibers have been broken a little bit or fractured, they're not going to come back quite the same. Farther down here, for instance, I've got just like a couple little hammer blows. So those will come right out. They're just very mild. that's done a lot just to try and lift those back out. Now the grain is raised a little bit in that area as a result of doing this so there's still going to be a little sanding that has to happen. There's another hammer blow around this nail. And even spots where the planking just got a little ding from something in the workshop you can you can hit those spots too. Okay now to fix the hole here what first thing I'm going to do is I've got a few fibers that are broken loose and I don't like that. Let's see if I can get some cyanoacrylate in there. So I'm just going to use some thinner viscosity stuff. I'll just try and tease a drop or two into that fractured material. There's going to be a multi-stage repair here. Okay. So now I'll just try and Push that carefully down into place. I'm just going to hold it there for a few moments. Let that adhesive cure. I may have to hit it with a blast of accelerator to get it to stay. Yeah. I find that, especially with softwoods, cyanoacrylate doesn't kick off very easily. Okay, I'm going to try just a little tiny shot of accelerator. There we go. Good. So that's laid that down nicely. So the next thing I want to do is I've got sort of an ugly scar there and I do not like that. This is basically the off cut from the, from the other end of the frame. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a spot on here that matches the grain as closely as possible to there and I'm going to cut a 3 8 inch plug out of there and I'm going to use my plug cutter to drill a hole and set a plug of wood in there with the grain matching. I think that'll do the best job of making that disappear. It won't be invisible. Um, the other way you can do it is you can do a traditional Dutchman which would be sort of a like a triangular shaped piece of material but eh, this this job is not doesn't really warrant going to that kind of trouble I think. Okay now I've taken it, my countersink bit and I've just put a straight drill bit into it instead of a tapered one and I've just left a little stub protruding. Now I just want to just cut just enough of a hole there that it um, I've got a good bite. So probably about half the diameter of this countersink, which is the countersink three eighths of an inch uh, in diameter. You can see just a little fiber not getting cut, so I'll try pushing that in there. That's better. I used a plug cutter to cut several different plugs and these are each just ever so slightly off the same off of on a different these are ever so slightly spaced differently along the grain so that I can try and match it up as best as possible. Now if I look here there's a few growth rings that are heavier than the others. I actually identified the same growth ring running right through the length of the, the board which is right about here is one of my other ones so I think I'm going to pick this one which shows that in the center, I'm just going to pop that out 
like so. And we'll just take a close look at this and see if I can, which one, which way it looks best. I think like that. So this is sitting, sitting just a little loose. It's because my plug cutters have gotten old and worn out and they've, uh, they've been sharpened about a thousand times. So I'm going to have to glue this one in with the heavier body glue. So I'll use epoxy on this, I think. But that looks pretty good. I think that grain's going to match up well. We'll glue that in. And I want the whole back of that void to be filled anyway. So epoxy is a perfect animal for doing that. We're going to put a little trunnel in from the other side that's going to fill where the nail was as well. We'll, uh, we'll put that in and we'll have to come back tomorrow, clean that up and see how that turned out. Okay, our plug has been sitting overnight. It's all epoxy is cured on it. I'm just going to use this little saw to cut it off. I'm not cutting it flush, leaving it a little proud. I'm going to take it flush with this chisel. Okay. Now one thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to warm up this slightly with a heat gun just to soften up that epoxy. See, that's all it took. Now I'm just going to go cross grain as I work this down. The trick here is you want to figure out which way the grain is running in this plug and avoid it diving down. And it looks like I've got to work uphill here a little bit. It's just a little tiny bit proud of the surface and I think I might actually just try taking this down with a scraper. It's by no means a perfect match, but it's not terrible. If you put a little water on there, that gives you a better idea. Now that plug is showing a bit lighter than the rest. This has had a lot of time to oxidize, and that's a very fresh wood, so that'll change over time. So I'm just going to take a little splinter of cedar here. All right, that's about the same diameter as our nail. That should be just perfect. I'm just gonna use a little bit of Tight Bond 3. Once we cut this off and put the new fastener in, it's gonna sit off to the side a little bit. It's not invisible, but it's not the kind of thing most people will notice at first or even second glance.